Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I must say good evening, those of us who are in the UK, um, those of us who, who are in the east of the world. I think it's um, a good morning. And for those in the west of the world, I think it's a good afternoon. So wherever you are in the world, I really thank you so much for joining this webinar. Um, it is the first of our global fireside webinars and we at the France Nightingale Foundation are hosting this this, after, this afternoon, this evening, this morning. Uh, I think it's going to be a really live and lively conversation between two US nursing greats. And um, I, I, we've asked them to talk about the topic of clinical excellence. And so in a minute, I'd like to introduce Dr. Le Linda Aitken and Dr. Carol Porter. And my name is Brita Westwood and I'm the Chief Executive of the Florence Nightingale. And I want to say thank you so much for joining. If you've got any questions as we go along, then please pop them in the chat box. And my colleagues who are behind this call will um, feed me the, the, the questions as we go along. Otherwise, we'll sa save them all for the last 15 minutes. So um, the plan is, there's always a plan, but I know these two, and it's likely that we might not stick to the plan, but it's good to start with a plan. And the plan is introduced to you both uh, both Linda and Carol to you and um, Carol will then interview Linda and then every so often I might just jump in because I'll find it difficult to not be able to do that so if I jump in it's just to either clarify some something or, or change the topic to another um, area so that we manage to get through a, a number of topics as we go on through this evening so as I said it put any um, chat any uh, questions in the chat function and um, we'll pose those questions on your behalf to Linda and Carol later on. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Linda Aitken, Dr. Linda Aitken. She is the Professor of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania um, School of Nursing. She's also Professor of Sociology at the School of Arts and Sciences, also at Pennsylvania. And she is the founding director of the, Clinic of the Center for Health Outcomes and Policy Research also at Pennsylvania. And I think it would be fair to say, Linda, you're, I'm sure you'll, you'll correct me, that your mantra, and uh, which is picked up by your own research, is that nurses hold the key to providing safer and more effective care and achieving be better outcomes for patients. And I think as we go on, go on through this, this chat this, after, this evening, that we'll get more of that, um, that coming out from Linda's, from Carol's questions to Linda and Linda's answers. So, um, Carol, I could spend, I'm going to do this on your behalf, but I could spend the whole evening talking to Linda about her CV and it would take over an hour to do it properly. So I literally picked out some um, highlights that I think it would be relevant for the audience to know about. So um, Linda's pioneer research has created an evidence base showing the importance of the impact of nurses caring for few patients each. Um, having more nurses with bachelor's or higher qualifications does improve the working, nursing work environments. Uh, a 30-day mortality uh, is often common after surgical procedures, but increased by 7% for each additional pace, patient added um, to the nurse's workload. Uh, and if we, um, for every 10% of nurses with bachelor degrees, there's a 5 to 7% decline in, in risk-related mortality. This is all Linda's work, we go on. So organizations that support professional nursing practice by involving nurses in decision-making have better outcomes than those matched organizations with poor work environments. And um, probably you may or may not know this, but uh, Linda, Linda's original research um, that's developed in, in California was uh, mandated around the nurse to patient ratios in hospital. And, and subsequently other states. And then beyond the US, this has been adopted in uh, as safe nursing staffing levels in Wales, Ireland and Queensland. I'm sure there's been others since. And as part of Linda's role as the founding director of the Penn Nursing Centre for Health and Outcomes Policy Research, the 4N cast uh, is one of the centres uh, uh, centers projects and this is based on her research and it's the largest study of its kind on nursing care and patient, out, patient outcomes in the United States. It's gone across the world and it's now been implemented across 30 countries. And um, the better work environments, I'm sure you'll all be pleased to know, the better that we create the work environments 
and we produce a higher value care for and reduce our mortality with similar lower costs, especially for the higher risk surgical patients. And you may not then know this because this happened a long time ago and I dug deep to find this. I hope this is right, Linda. So before even all of that long list, Linda led the effort to improve clinical work environments for nurses when she was president of the American Academy of Nursing in 1979. And this led to Magnet's recognition program, which is you, you'll know as accreditation program for nursing that represents high quality working environments that results in better patient outcomes. Um, and she's been a, an authority on nurse shortages around the world. So it's no wonder we invited Linda today to discuss this important topic of driving clinical excellence through change. If I've got any of that wrong, I'm sure Carol will pick that up in the conversation. And, and over to um, Carol, who's going to interview Linda this evening. So Carol is the Chief Nursing Officer at University of Texas and MD Anderson Cancer Center. She came to Houston in 2016 from a previous role as CNO at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And as well as a huge long career, she spent over 25 years in the most senior leadership positions. MD Anderson is one of the largest cancer centers in the world, and it's working to eliminate cancer. Um, for more, it's been doing that for more than seven decades. And if any of you have seen MD Anderson's cancer center logo, you'll see that the cancer has been scrubbed out, which I love. I've never forgotten seeing that. Um, but one of the, has since the 1990s, being ranked as one of the um, best cancer centers in America's best hospital rankings. And it has more nurses per patient than many hospitals in the country, which clearly is essential to deliver clinical excellence and a topic I know we'll come back to later on in this conversation. So she's championed nursing um, research and education. She's a passion for driving innovations to improve patient care and clinical ex excellence. And in MD Anderson, she um, successfully com completed the fifth consecutive magnet recognition um, through the accredit 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 accreditation center. And um, prior to MD Anderson, she was the chief nurse for 12 years at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And again, during her tenure, she was awarded, the hospital was all, all awarded twice the magnet designation. Um, and um, she, I also know through Digging Deep that um, she was Chief Nursing Officer at, um, at um, Mount Sinai Hospital during the 9-11 attacks. And um, maybe we'll hear more about that later. But um, I also read, Carol, that you ran the New York Marathon in, 20, in 2001, soon after the attack. And again, a really, I'm sure, a, a huge example of nursing leadership. And perhaps we might hear a a little bit about that later on. So I'm going to hand over to um, Linda and Carol now. And um, Linda, before that, I think Carol's going to ask you some questions, uh, particularly around your nursing career. Really impressive. Clearly, we've we've had lots of um, academic positions and and uh, a, a really long career, and you're still there, banging the drum, which is incredible. And I think if I hand over to Carol now, Carol might want to know a little bit more about some of the highlights in that leadership journey. And then I've got a question for Carol afterwards, if that's OK. Have we go on to that question. Yes, thank you. So, OK, Carol, Linda, I'm going to ask you that question then. So oh. an impressive career. Uh, tell us a bit more about your leadership journey to date and some of the highlights along the way. Well, thank you, Rita. And I'm I'm so delighted to be here with Carol Porter, a uh, very uh, admired colleague who's on the front lines. And uh, we, we share a lot in common. And um, just before we start now, I didn't provide the one little um, detail about my background that was relevant to Carol's introduction which is I ran the 2005 Philadelphia Marathon. So sometime we'll have to compare our times, yeah, <laughs> but maybe <now>. not online. <laughs> <laughs> we finished, we finished, that's good enough. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, it's really a fabulous opportunity uh, to, 
to join the Florence Nightingale Foundation Global Initiative uh, with this kickoff meeting. And I would like to say hello in case any of my Magnet for Europe hospitals are on today. Um, I'm going to talk later about how um, the big project that I think is the capstone of what I've done so far is to take the successful Magnet model that's been such a game changer, particularly in the U.S. for improving hospital work environments and trying to scale it up in Europe. So we have 65 European hospitals in six countries that are twinned one-to-one -one with U.S. Magnet hospitals. And we are, have embarked upon a really ambitious project to improve work environments and to show or test really whether the magnet model is indeed an international idea. So I'd like to say hello and always to thank my partners in Europe working on um, Magnet for Europe. So uh, just a few comments. Um, I, I have always loved hospitals. And so if we have hospital nurses on, I just wanted to say that. I always wanted to be a hospital nurse. My clinical area has always been post-surgical care, first uh, thoracic surgery, and then I became one of the first clinical nurse specialists in the US, uh, focusing on um, post-cardiac uh, surgery care. At the time, and I mentioned that because I think it's important because it's really informed all the research that I've done, because I like to say that literally my first night as a nurse at a good hospital, I was all of a sudden working like every other nurse <laughs> working on the night shift at the time, and I realized that the work environments were nowhere near what they needed to be for the acuity of the patients that we were responsible for. And that's how I got interested in studying this issue over my whole lifetime about the adequacy of the clinical work environments that all nurses are practicing in, whether they're in the hospital or in other settings. Um, we know now that um, we have a lot of clinical evidence about interventions that work under controlled circumstances. But when you put them in real life, they don't always work in the same way. And this is one of our biggest challenges. And so what I've been studying really for the past 30 years is the impact of the work environment on basically um, impacting what nurses can do and the impact of what they do on patient outcomes. And so I, you know, first as a clinical nurse, I was very interested in trying to change the environment myself. So I was young at the time and I thought getting a PhD at age um, 25 would allow me to jump the age queue and run my own hospital and my own nursing school. Cause I wanted to like, run them both the way they should be and create a nursing school, which would, you know, allow nurses, new nurses to learn how to practice ideally. And then a hospital that would permit them to practice ideal. But in the process, I kind of got sidelined by the excitement of doing research and understanding that if you do health services research and you do it right and you do it strategically and you focus on policy issues, you can affect the care of millions of patients and hundreds of thousands of nurses. As a nurse, I was also very interested in affecting the outcomes of my patients. Uh, but when you see the multiplier effect, I think, of research, it's, uh, it's, it's a very um, wonderful career, and I've had a lot of students along the way, um, and we've kind of created a whole field of this kind of research, but we keep doing increasingly larger and larger and larger studies, trying to uh, imagine what the questions are going to be from both management, leadership, and healthcare, and policymakers, and then to have the empirical answers to the questions by the time they're answered. So a lot of it is having the right timing and uh, being on the same page with policymakers and leaders. So that's what I've now spent my career doing. So we do very large studies in the US of many hundreds of hospitals and 
uh, tens of thousands of nurses and literally millions of patients. And then we've also, as Greta said, actually taken that research and replicated it now in over 30 countries because we believe and we are finding that nursing is more alike from country to country than it is different. And really nursing, even within institutions, even within the hospital sector and ambulatory care and long-term care, it is more similar than it is different. And so we're searching for the global answers to improve the impact of nursing on patient outcomes and also to recruit and retain a really talented group of nurses to take care of patients in all of our countries and globally. That's in a thumbnail sketch, what I've been up to. You're, you're on mute, Greta. Do I never put myself on mute, mute? And when I do, I always forget I'm on mute. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Carol, I'm just going to ask one question to you, and then I'll let you take over with this Farso chat. And my question, Carol, is um, your career, as I said in, in the introduction, has taken you from one side of the US to the other. And, of course, you're a complete champion of magnet accredited um, uh, organizations. Um, and I wondered whether you could tell those that are listening this evening what motivated you to take on such huge nursing opportunities um, throughout your distinguished career. And, and you've done this in pursuit of clinical excellence. So what was the inspiration? What was the motivation? And um, what was your driving force? So from first being a young nurse, um, I was fascinated uh, and wanted to learn more. So, and I told many, many people, put your hand up. When people ask for a volunteer, your hand goes up, whether you know, the, whether you know it or not, because you're going to learn that and then add that to your repertoire. So I have constantly taken on challenges willingly and learned them and then use them going forward. Uh, I have, uh, from the first time I took care of a patient, I was fascinated by uh, how, what the impact we can have just by connecting with them emotionally. So emotional intelligence, understanding what they're going through, the caregivers, their families, how we can, uh, sometimes we don't even have to talk. I've been, I was a trauma nurse and sometimes you couldn't talk, the patient couldn't talk, but he knew that you were there. And so that the theory of being with, you know, just being with someone is, is, a, is part of nursing, uh, just the comfort and the safety. With Magnet, uh, in the beginning of Magnet, it was a little bit different than, I can't even remember when Karen directly became the, the leader of Magnet across the country, was to me a sea change. All of a sudden, quality metrics and everything turned around. And I loved it. I fell in love with Magnet. Uh, eventually, um, while I was a chief nurse in New York, I was a Magnet sir, uh, appraiser because I wanted to see it from not only my side, but from the uh, Magnet office side. And uh, it's really an overview of how you can in, you can embed quality structure in a hospital. And it comes in because of nursing, but it stays because of teams. So as we go for our six des designations since 2001, it brands our hospital. And, and it, it, when they come in to survey us, they survey our whole team. So uh, I would say a passion about quality outcomes. And Linda and I, you know, we're, we're interested in the same thing, but I, I fell in love with... Uh, the frontline, the frontline leaders, um, the patients and families, and I wanted to help the the frontline staff understand how important their role is. So that's why that's why I've stayed in, and and that has brought me. I want to say to six different countries. Once you're known for quality um, and magnet, uh, people want to know how you do it. I worked with unions successfully, so it's just a passion of mine. But thank you, Greta. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, the floor is yours. We, we're desperate to hear um, okay. what the conversation is. Okay, Linda, is. here we go. So question number one, and you have an amazing background, and, you know, I've read so many of your articles, and, you know, and you have, I think, just about every award that a nurse can get. So, but when you were a new nurse, what were the main challenges you faced and overcame during your early career? Because you were a trendsetter. You were out for, in the forefront. If you could share that with us. Um, thank you. Uh, that's a tough question while I look back over my career. But 
You know, always uh, from the beginning, I was fascinated with the work of Florence Nightingale. And she was so savvy and so smart about using existing data and and working on problems that were of a very pressing public nature and healthcare nature with so many uh, British soldiers dying in the Crimea. And Florence Nightingale really developed comparative statistics, proportional statistics. Uh, She was such an amazing person. And um, the work that she did has really had a lasting impact. And you can pick up journals now and they cite Florence Nightingale. I'm talking about, you know, contemporary studies are citing, you know, her focus on bringing together existing data and showing how changing the work environment, which is what she was trying to do, really impacts patient outcomes. And so I was influenced by that overall context of working. And so in order to do that, I had to be a quantitative researcher. And um, that's a tough road to hoe to learn how to do complex statistics. Uh, Everybody doesn't need to do it, but we need to have some capacity in nursing. Yes, nursing research wasn't after Florence Nightingale, there was a very long period of time in which some researchers were observing in studies of, for example, hospital mortality that nurse staffing seemed to have something to do with it, was never developed, it was never pulled forward, it was never emphasized. And so we really had to build a whole field that wasn't there of quantitative uh, nursing outcomes research. So that was kind of one big challenge. Uh, We had to get our research in interdisciplinary journals. Um, I always say to nurses, most of the things that I've been studying for 30 years, you already know the answers to. Nurses know, I am trying to document what the answers are for people that are not nurses. So that means that we had to get into interdisciplinary journals where nurses had never published before, the big journals like the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine. And so to do those, you had to do huge, big studies. And so I had to, you know, take on the challenge, almost like Florence Nightingale did, of looking for some other data that had already been collected by other people because the data that you needed was too big for you to ever collect it yourself. And then throughout my career, even early on, but still today, The reality is that there are some stakeholders in healthcare that don't really want to know the answers to some questions, or they don't like the answers once you find them. Vice President Gore used to talk about inconvenient truths uh, that he discovered with regard to climate change. And I have also discovered some, some truths that some people in healthcare think are inconvenient. One of the big ones is that we found, as Greta said, that the more professional nurses in every environment, the better the outcomes. Well, there are many stakeholders in healthcare that don't want to hear that as an answer because they would rather minimize labor in order to control costs. And it's just not possible to do that, our research shows. Another thing that Greta mentioned was our work on education. And Although different countries have different educational systems, all of us have kind of slowly been moving nursing into higher education where physicians and engineers and other people doing scientific work uh, were getting their education. And that was controversial because there were a lot of stakeholders that had an investment in nursing schools that were not in higher education. And there were a lot of nurses that didn't have degrees in higher education. And so that was a very difficult um, way to walk where uh, we did find that nurses that have a university education, the more of them there are, the better the outcomes. And I was very thankful, Carol, that uh, when we found that in the US, and we've also found that in Europe as well and published in The Lancet, that what helped us resolve those questions were that nurse executives saw that evidence immediately and took it to heart 
even though it might not have been in their interest because baccalaureate education somewhat longer, takes somewhat longer to educate a nurse, but they immediately looked at the scientific data and they said, okay, we're accepting this as the preferential degree in the U.S. for nurses. And after that, they started um, preferentially hiring nurses. And then there wasn't any discussion anymore because the whole thing changed. Now in Europe, there's still discussion because some countries like Germany Baccalaureate education is still very, very new. And they're going down a similar pathway that we went down in the US. Like what can a baccalaureate nurse really do in practice? And here we have the US about 40 years, you know, in advance of that, kind of wondering, well, almost what could a nurse without a baccalaureate degree <laughs> do in some areas of practice? And so this has been an interesting path to, to follow, but I would have to say that really Although there were opponents of this work over time, it's been very well accepted. Um, those are some of the big challenges. Thank you, Linda. Uh, I would I agree. Uh, and now we're so metric focused that when we have the metrics to show, uh, really it's about the acuity of the patient and what that patient needs, and that then that dictates the nursing and it dictates the level of nurse. So. Absolutely correct. So another question, Linda. We've heard so much about your background, the founding director of the Center for Health Outcomes and Policy Research, uh, and also looking to recruit promising nurses into research careers. So what would you say to encourage nurses and midwives at the beginning of their careers to encourage them to consider a future in clinical research? Many, many times I hear nurses that really would love to learn more and they're almost afraid. So how would you encourage them to pursue that quest? Well, I actually did my first um, study that I published in the um, journal Nursing Research. When I look back on it, it's kind of amazing as a 22-year-old, I published in our big <laughs> nursing research journal with an idea that grew right out of my practice. And you know, I think we all have to realize that there are a lot of things in healthcare that we accept as a conventional wisdom that those of us who work in clinical care know through our practice that either we don't know the answer to some of the things we need to know the answers to, or some th answers are really not the correct answers. And so I think if we can all as nurses, we should have a questioning perspective. We shouldn't really take anything for granted, especially if it runs counter to our own experience as nurses. So um, to let clinical practice inform possible studies and then go get help to do studies. I mean, doing research, you know, is not something that we all know how to do when we're young. I just give you one example. Um, when I was working in open heart surgery early on, um, you know, there were a lot of things about the heart lung machine that we didn't understand. And uh, one thing I noticed, and in those days, we used to admit patients, you know, a week or even more before they had surgery. So I got to know all the patients. And then postoperatively, they were completely psychotic, pulling out all of their tubes. Well, this is a very dangerous thing. It was very upsetting to the family. It was very upsetting to the doctors. It was upsetting to everyone. And so I wondered if there was anything we could do preoperatively to try to prevent this psychosis from happening postoperatively. I mean, it turned out to be a, somewhat of a physiological explanation. We didn't know it at the time. So I went to see a professor of psychology that was working at the university where I was practicing in a teaching hospital and said, this is the behavior I'm observing as a nurse. Is this anything as a psychologist you have any answers for? And yes, he did. You know, he had an intervention called systematic relaxation where patients could learn to systematically go through a process of relaxing themselves to my voice. And I was there post-op and actually we did a randomized trial and we showed that this worked. I was so excited and all the other nurses and doctors are so excited because it was a question that came up in practice. We didn't know how to solve it. Other people outside of nursing and medicine were interested in helping to solve it. So I guess the bottom line is that 
we in nursing have so many interesting questions. And my experience is that everybody that is at all involved in research, no matter what their feels, they're so interested in helping us answer these questions. So have a questioning mind and try to find some partners that, you know, know something more than you do, and then just tackle some of these things because it's so rewarding that then you'll just kind of keep going on and on. Thank you, Linda. Uh, that was that was a great answer. Uh, and um, it may reassure a lot of people on the call. So Greta, Greta, do you want me to keep going? I have a bunch of questions. Okay, so n- here we are, hopefully in the end of the pandemic, uh, looking at staffing shortages, staffing levels, nurses uh, rethinking their life after the experience they went through on the front lines and everybody across the world actually who lost friends and family members and were afraid in the beginning of a novel virus. So is there anything, any key lessons you would draw from your research to support nursing and midwifery leaders advocating and influence, influencing their workforce and trying to stabilize? Over to you, Linda. Well, yes, we, since we do big studies all the time, we happen to do a giant study right before COVID. I mean, it was right on the cusp before we had ever heard the word COVID, but it was two months before where we studied all hospitals in two big states in the U.S. and all the nurses that worked in those hospitals and all the patients. And what we found was that already burnout in the U.S. was over 50 percent of all direct care nurses in hospitals were burnt out. And similarly, a quarter of them said that if they could, they would leave their their jobs in hospitals because they were so frustrated with the work environment. So one thing that we have learned through our research is that all the problems that we're experiencing now predated COVID. And I think that is so important for us to recognize because if we think we could just go back to what we had before COVID, it is not good enough and it will not solve our problems recruiting and retaining nurses or our safety problems with our patients. So that's a big lesson. Uh, Two other things that we found without a shadow of a doubt is that the two biggest reasons why both nurses and physicians, we're also studying physicians and the burnout rates of physicians are pretty comparable now to nurses. So this is just not a nursing phenomena, and I'm sure it's affecting other health professionals as well that we haven't studied directly, like um, respiratory therapists and other people that come into contact with sick patients. But the two things that both physicians and nurses agree on, interestingly enough, is there not enough nurses in clinical settings. The physicians say that as well as the nurses. So this is not just nurses saying there are not enough nurses. The physicians are agreeing that the number one reason why nurses are so burnt out and physicians are so burnt out and frustrated is that our healthcare system is not employing enough clinical nurses in all of our various settings, hospitals, long-term care, schools, and in the community. And that is stressing not only the nurses, but everybody else in the healthcare system. And the second thing is that the work environments are archaic. There's there's really nothing else to say about the work environments. I mean, the work environments are like, I imagine they must've been in the 1900s. They are not recognizing that You have um, people that want to work in healthcare for a career. They're not there for two or three years before they have children and then they quit. They want to be there for 25 years. And so in order to keep people at the bedside in clinical care, they have to have rewarding work. And, And nurse, a point that I always like to make is no matter what you say about the pandemic or all of the stressful things about nursing, Nursing and medicine are inherently interesting things to do. Talk about working in a bank, being an attorney, or all the other things that people are. 
it's much more inherently interesting. And that's why, at least in the U.S. and I think in the U.K. as well, you have a lot of people with degrees in other fields that now want to come into nursing because it is interesting. So that's the first big hurdle. It's interesting. So then it's for healthcare to lose people because they're inherently interested in being clinicians and we're losing them because we haven't created work environments that allow people to balance their family and their work and their personal um, interests and their professional interests. So the work-life balance is way off. We're not flexible enough to take advantage of the long time period that people want to be in healthcare, which means some people will be older, some people will be younger. Should they all be working exactly the same? Uh, just uh, came across a um, policy in Belgium that I had never heard of before. By the way, Belgium has the lowest burnout in Europe and they have two, to me, intriguing policies. One is that older nurses, can get paid full time for working a few less hours in um, reference to the fact that, you know, when you age, you can't necessarily work at the same level. And so why should older people be necessarily penalized for that? There's a lot of flexibility. People can work part time any amount of time they want without any rigid kind of requirements. And the second thing that impressed me so much is that serious burnout is a criteria for short-term disability. And if you're experiencing burnout as a doctor or a nurse, you can qualify for disability and you're no longer there trying to take care of patients, probably to the detriment of the patients as well as yourselves. So kind of modernizing the work environment is so necessary for doctors and nurses that, and everyone that works there. It should not be torturous. We should not have to be heroes to work in healthcare. So those are the big things. We don't have enough nurses and we really don't have modern work environments that appreciate that people have different roles in life. They have to be able to do multiple things and that they should be able to work over a, a lifetime without burning out. Thank you. Carol, okay. can I just ask you a question about um, the pandemic from the front line, from, from being there throughout the pandemic and you being holding the position of nurses and midwives who've literally held the front line for the last two years. What do you think the um, professions we've learned as as professionals um, about working practices during the pandemic and throughout all of the disasters and all the, the losses, are there some things that we have done so differently so, and innovated that we mustn't let go of? So, so thanks for that question, Greg. It's a good one. Um, remember when it, you know, we watched it coming over, you know, we wa we first hit into, in New York area and in Houston, Texas, we, I have a lot of colleagues in New York, so I was on the phone with them asking what's going on, what's happening. Uh, and I think that we made safety our number one, safety of our patients and safety of our staff, because some hospitals across the country were having problems having nursing uh, accepting assignments in the COVID areas. Uh, we implemented, you know, spotters like they, you know, used in the military. And so everywhere there was a COVID patient, we had spotters outside making sure no one broke PPE to make sure that, that they were not infecting themselves. Uh, I found that the staff so appreciated the safety concentration we had, and not just MD Anderson across the United States. A lot of hospitals really focused on safety of the patients, safety of the staff. Um, and I think that was tremendous. Um, also, how do we communicate with the patients and the staff through, we learned about virtual visits, you know, telemedicine, you know, on and on and on. We were able to do so many things like that. Um, I think what I learned specifically was, well, I, I round a lot. I mean, rounding is part of my management style. I do it all the time. I do it with a lot of people. I do it with our president, the doctors, myself. And I, and I have a very good relationship with the frontline staff. So they're, they, tell me, they tell me a lot of good things that I can help them with and I can recognize them for. But uh, the word I heard a lot was value. And so finally I started asking, 
you know, go to the front line and ask them, what does value mean to you? Because sometimes leaders think, oh, they want to feel valued. Let's send them pizza. Let's send them cookies. Let's send them this. No. What does value mean to you? So we started really identifying from the staff, the frontline staff, what would make them feel safer, more valued, et cetera. So a lot of recognition, a lot of visibility. Um, and then really, I think today, the, the long, the, the going to one area and working for a long time, it, it's just not the way it's happening today. And as a chief nursing officer, uh, I understand that. You know, a lot of nurses come here, they want to become NPs. They're here for three years, they graduate NP school, and then we hire them. So it's a trajectory. It's in healthcare, and it may be in nursing, but it's not uh, what it used to be where someone would go to a hospital and stay there 15, 20 years. And the other thing is they want, um, they realize that they do want a balanced life, and they want it supported by the by the institution. They want to know, we want you to go on that vacation. Go take your family to the football game. We want you to do that, uh, to celebrate you being with your family, which is not historically the way things were. So really understanding that and and putting them on the front line, getting them involved, listening to them, getting their ideas and putting them in there. So I think it's a lot of, and then even, even the way you onboard nurses, we're thinking about tracks, different tracks of nurses, not just go to med surgery, or go to cancer, or go to this. Like, If you want to be a researcher, maybe you have a research track. You spend this much time here. You spend this much time here. We're trying to reinvent it with our staff uh, and working very closely with our academic partners. We partner with over 30 universities and really understanding how can we help the academic partners accept more students? Well, they need more clinical placements. Well, how can we participate in the clinical placements? to help them with their students. So it's, it's bringing everybody much, much closer together to solve a problem. And, there's, and it's, it's, many hospitals have plenty of openings that just aren't the nurses aren't out there. And that's what we're, we're going through right now. But I have to tell you, can it speak, I, I think nurses across the country, across the world, are doing the best they can with what's going on. So thank you for that question. Sorry, back to you, back to you, Linda. I'll, I'll try not to jump in again. No, jump in whenever. Okay, so let's see where we are. So, Linda, you know, on that topic of well-being, uh, what do you see in your research and on how do we, what new ways can we support uh, nursing? And we're talking about nurses right now, but it's really healthcare workers. How can we better support our healthcare workers and nurses? So they do feel they're uh, able to have a balanced life. Well, uh, we asked both nurses and physicians very recently, um, what do you, what changes do you think would improve your well-being? And it was very interesting because uh, the most frequently tried things in hospitals in the U.S. are things like resilience training quiet rooms where you can, you know, uh, think and, and uh, let go. And um, are those the things that doctors and nurses wanted? And they said a resounding, no, <laughs> we want more nurses hired and, and kept. Um, we, want, uh, our, we want to have breaks in the day. You know, most nurses uh, and also physicians are working long hours in the U.S. Uh, and to work 12 hours without having recognized breaks, they wanted their breaks. Third, they wanted the electronic health record system fixed. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about whether technology can help uh, clinicians deal with um many of these challenges that come from very acute patients and technology has the potential to facilitate clinical care, but it's not realizing its potential. And that was one of the biggest things that we found more so in the U S than Europe, but Europe is also now just bringing in many hospitals, the same electronic health records that the doctors and nurses hate in the US, I hate to tell you that. Um, but the systems are, and not only electronic health systems, but a lot of technology is developed by non-clinicians. 
And so when you try to use it in clinical practice, it doesn't have good clinical usability. So I've asked some of my friends and colleagues who actually work in electronic health record companies, why can't you make these systems more usable? And one thing that the audience today might be interested in is they say that the end users, the doctors and nurses, don't demand that the usability be fixed. So managers that are not clinicians are buying the systems and don't totally understand where they fall off clinically. And either the clinicians that use them are not empowered or don't speak out. And so we don't have enough of a feedback loop going on to fix our technology over time. But I guess the the main takeaway from our research is that the doctors and nurses are scoffing at hospitals saying, we'll provide you with more mental health services. Uh, They want to get rid of the burnout, basically, and not have it anymore, not to go to mental health services. Can I just add to that, Carol, before you go on? Um, I think that's a really, really valid point, um, Linda, that you make about the the nurses not having the voice about what the what the what the digital solution needs to be. And um, I was talking to some nurses earlier on with Stuart from New York Presbyterian Hospital. And I mentioned that in the foundation, we've now started to develop a cadre of digital nurse and midwife leaders across Wales and England. And both countries have started to embed the CNI, a CNIO role in the structure of the NHS. And it, it's gradually making a difference. It's gradually raising the voice um, uh, uh, of authority for the nurse to say, actually, that piece of kit's not going to work because of X, Y, and Z. Or we want to be, we want you, we want the manufacturers to talk to us about what solutions they've got. So I think slowly, slowly, um, I don't know that that's as you say, Linda, that's perhaps the same in, across the US. But um, but I, it's amazing already the, the difference our digital nurse and midwife leaders are making. So um, I think watch that space. Thank you, Carol. Back to you. So I think. I think Linda answered the next question I was going to ask. So uh, about digital technology, I thought you did very well on that question uh, and that topic. So I, I believe, uh, should I move on to global nurse and midwife situation? Carol, Carol could I just add one note on the sure. technology part? <clears throat> we see a lot of um, <clears throat> conversation now about using technology to substitute for clinicians. Uh. There's this big hope out there that the shortage of doctors and nurses and other clinicians will be solved by electronic health records, uh, artificial intelligence, robots, all of these non-human kind of issues. But one of the things that research is finding, and this is especially true for nursing of all the different occupations in healthcare, technologies are enabling nurses to do more. And so you need more nurses. They're not substituting for nurses. And so I can't even think of one technology, Carol, maybe you can, where it's ever saved any nurse's time. It All the technologies that we've introduced really take more nurses, the monitoring. If you're gonna monitoring everything, It just simply takes more nurses. The alarms are going off all the time. You have all this alarm fatigue. You have so many alarms that you're hampered by providing basic care because you have like computer medication delivery systems that um, are not really delivering, you know, the usual medications uh, that people you know, need to keep going with their practices. And we just had a terrible case in the US where a nurse was prosecuted basically in a manslaughter case because of a computerized medication delivery system that delivered a medication on a general unit that would have only ever been used in the operating room because it paralyzes respiration. It should have never, there should have been never a, 
ever a reason for that medication to have been delivered. So there are all these things that are now going on so that nurses are having to monitor the machines that are supposed to be saving time. So if you really look at the research on technology, technology can really improve care and it can enhance enhance what nurses do, but it's just expanding nurses' scope of authority, the responsibilities that nurses have. And I think in our lifetime, it's not going to substitute for nurses. There may be some support services in healthcare, um, the delivery of supplies and things like that, that might substitute for some other workers. But I just think I wanted to put that on the table, Carol, because I know there are a lot of people on management that have come out of manufacturing and a lot of our policymakers also that have run big companies. And they think the solution to the shortage of doctors and nurses are computers and robotics and artificial intelligence, but there's just no evidence whatsoever that that's the case. So I think we have to provide an informed response to that so that they don't think that that's the magic bullet that's going to solve these problems of the shortage of of real clinicians at the bedside or in whatever setting it is. Thank you. Do you have a response to that? I think uh, there's probably positive and negative. Uh, so I've probably seen more positive than negative. Uh, it is, um, you know, it is a challenge for healthcare. Uh, to, to, I mean, it gives you so much more data. Part of it's it, you have so much more data. So I don't know. That's a po- I mean, it's, it's a positive. You have more data, and then you have to do something with that data. Mm-hmm. But it also, in many cases, can be used as an added layer of safety. I'll give you an example. Uh, we developed a hemovigilance unit which we give, a, we give, I think, the most blood in the United States. So uh, it, you know, we have a team, it's, it's like an E, uh, the old EICUs, well, it's like an E uh, transfusion center. It's monitored by physicians and NPs and nurses. And every single transfusion 24-7 in all of our sites is pulled up in that, this center. Uh, they go into the charts, they watch the patients, so if you're the nurse at the bedside, no matter what time, no matter where you are, anywhere in MD Anderson, uh, you can, in a phone call, have that person who's also already involved in the care. So that is, I can't tell you how amazing that is. It's amazing. So I think it maybe maybe the issue is that we still have to harness the power of uh, an, an electronic medical record. We're still learning, but I, I see, I do see a lot of positive. Thank you. Yeah, me too. I just, I don't want anybody to think that I'm negative yeah. about technology. I, I think it, what it does is enhance the role of nurse. It doesn't substitute. Right. Right. That's right. A- right. Hmm. So just looking at the time, we've got about six minutes left. Um, I, I, Carol, would it be okay if you asked the, the global nurse midwife situation? And I was going to introduce sure. that by saying, you know, the world is facing this world shortage of, of nurses, uh, estimated about 6 million nurse shortages across the world and 900,000 midwives. And and and, and it, it's evident from the research that about 89% of those nurse shortages are concentrated in the low and the lower middle income countries. And um, I'm sure the people on this call today would be <laughs> interested to know um, their role, everyone's role in the, in in, to, uh, in trying to have a, an impact and a, um, a finding a solution to the global workforce. And I don't know, whether, Linda, whether that's popped up in your research to date, or if it hasn't. Just both of you at the top of your head, where what can we do? Well, we're working all over the world, including um, some of the low and um, moderate income countries, and we have observed a couple of things. First of all, access to education, especially for women, is key. Mm-hmm. If, you know, because healthcare is in almost all countries, predominantly women, uh, not just nursing, but medicine in many other countries uh, are, are predominantly women. And so not providing enough access to education for women is one of those uh limiting factors in many, many countries. Um, 
So working on that end, but we also find that there that many countries now, low and middle income countries, are producing more nurses than they are creating jobs for in their own countries. So this is setting up a very sort of bad situation. I mean, it could be good if you're a nurse in one of those countries and you want to migrate to another country, then being a nurse gives you the opportunity now to migrate anywhere in the world. But a lot of people don't really want to leave their countries. I mean, their families are there, their relatives are there. Um, and so uh, they want to be a nurse in their country. So we've been uh, working in Latin America uh, with a, a number of health ministers and pointing out in Latin America that most countries there are producing more nurses than they're really employing. So that, you know, is a huge wasted resource and, and their education is very good. Uh, but for the nurses to be fully employed, uh, either they have to develop some new roles, which they're in the process of doing, or the whole labor um, situation has to change. And these countries have to understand that if they want to have hospitals like MD Anderson, in Latin America, there are many countries that are you know, copying MD Anderson, trying to copy MD Anderson. But in order to do that, they have to have nursing staff like MD Anderson, because that's what's made MD Anderson famous with all these great outcomes. But if you look at their hospitals, they're staffing more 16 patients to one nurse or even higher, even though they have plenty of nurses. So it's not only having good nursing education, but it should change the healthcare system in those source countries so that they hire their own nurses. Right. And, you know, this may be something that needs to be approached by the World Bank and some of the, you know, large sort of external resources uh, used for development because nursing is a fabulous um, mobility into the middle class. And those countries are really lacking a middle class. And there's hardly any, only teachers, teachers and nurses are the best entree in low and middle income countries of more people into the middle class, which then contributes to raising the standard of living across you know, these countries in general. So I think more focus, not only on training more nurses, but using them more domestically for the people that wanna stay in the countries and be nurses, rather than having to leave your own country to be a nurse. Which um, there's a question in the chat from a midwife who says, uh, Linda, I was just wondering if your research extends into midwifery um, the ability to be able to provide large scale evidence on maternal and neonatal outcomes when midwives and the right numbers of midwives who have completed a BSc based on the ICM standards are the main care providers would be very influential in women's health globally is within the within the constraints of time left because I think an hour is not long enough to talk with <laughs> you. Uh, do you have a, 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 a view on that? Well, yes, and I, I apologize. Uh, this is an American thing because I, I'm sure the um, person that raised the question probably knows uh, we don't separate nurses and midwives in the U.S. And so all of us tend to say nurses to encompass midwives because you have to, in the U.S., be a nurse to be a midwife. So I apologize for that. And we understand that there are different pathways in other countries. But yes, we find very much so that in studies of um, midwifery and in neonatal care, that it's really nurses and midwives, I should say midwives, that are driving the better outcomes. So yes, everything when I say nurse, please <laughs> translate it into nurses and midwives as well. Um, we're you know sort of very focused now on excess maternal mortality across the world. Even in rich countries like the U.S., we have significant ex, uh, excess maternal mortality, and we have so many models that show that midwives can reduce that mortality. So there's plenty of evidence there. Again, yes, and it's more I think a matter of having enough resources in low and middle income countries to actually employ midwives. 
so they can practice and not leave their country as well. Thank you, Linda. I'm going to give Carol the last question because I realize I've asked probably too many and it's not my, it wasn't my show, it was Carol's show. And then I wanted to ask the, there aren't many questions in, in the chat box. I picked out that one because I know there are some midwives in the audience. And then before we finish, I just wanted a chance to just talk about very briefly about the work of the Florence Nightingale Foundation Global. And then I wanted to ask everybody who's been on the call today is just in the chat box, write two words or one word that's, that exemplifies um, this last hour with both of you. I think that would be fascinating. I was going to write a wordle um, about all the things that I've identified as you were speaking. Um, but I want, the, I want those who are listening to you to do that rather than me. So um, is that okay, Carol? You, one more question from you, and then I'll just very, very briefly talk about FNF Global. So can I go off script? Do it help yourself. <laughs> I actually think uh, the combination of Linda and I, you know, practice and academics research is great because we see it from very some – there's very many, many common threads and we just see it from a different view. Um, and that's why I think the partnership between academics and practice and research is so important so that we don't have one view. Uh, so I would ask Linda, uh, if you were to redesign um, how nursing should be in a hospital, what would you do? Not, not the numbers of people, but the way and you've been around for a long time, as I have, uh, the way it works and the way you think it would work better. I would do um, more um, having nurses have panels of patients and not be tied to specific locations in the hospital. I'd have them, uh, and MD Anderson would be a great place to do this, uh, to if nurses had panels of patients, they could follow them into the ambulatory setting, which would give them more variety on what they did in the day. It would give them more opportunity to see what happens to their patients. And, you know, that's rewarding in and of itself to see that the care you provided when they were so critically ill made a really big difference in their ability to go back to their lives and be happy and functioning. So I would, you know, untie at least a large share of nurses from a physical unit and assign them to a panel and a population of patients. I would do what Magnet is doing, uh, which is called empowering of clinicians. I mean, I guess to explain a very simple way, Magnet is really trying to turn upside down the typical power bureaucracy in healthcare where all the leaders at the top make the most money and they have the most to say about things. And the clinicians that are the closest to patients and make all the decisions about life and death of the patients are, you know, have the least influence. And I would flip that paradigm. And all the evidence shows that this is a finding even in the most successful corporations of any kind in any sector that if the people the closest to producing the product of the organization are the most empowered and supported by the rest of the organization, the product improves. And in so many settings, nurses are the most important people. I mean, there are lots of important people, but nurses, for reasons we don't have time to talk about today, are the most important people because they're in the nexus of patient care. They're interacting with every single other person that's interacting with the patient. And so they are really high value providers and they should have more influence, more decision making. And there should be more focus in the organization and making sure that they are productive and happy and perform well. And that's not the way our organizations are currently set up. Thank you. I think Greta, I think we're out of questions. Agree. We are. Well, yes. I mean, that sounds like we're going to have to come get you to come back again. There is something <laughs> somebody said, I am um, understanding about uh, nurses in practice, academia research is such a, a valuable resource that we, we just need to know more about that the whole time. And, 
and right. spread the word that the, the, the career, a nurse, a nurse or midwife's career, it can transcend all of those areas at once or, or independent of each other or one after the other. So fascinating. So people are starting to put their words in the chat box now. I'm not sure if you can see them. Yes. Um, so thank you, everyone, for doing that. I want to say thank you, Linda and Carol, for your time spent today. Um, I'll say it's the afternoon or, or very late afternoon. But thank you so much. I know it's taken a while for you to prepare for this. Um, it sounds like we should have you back to talk about something else. Um, it's been amazing. I'm looking forward to seeing you, Carol, very soon next month. Yes. Um, after yes. all the years. We'll welcome you to MD Anderson very soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Linda, I know that you've worked with fellow academics of mine at the University of Southampton. So I know that that work will continue. But a really big thank you to both of you. I, I can see lots and lots of comments on, on the chat. Um, Stuart, shall we put up that last slide about the work of the foundation? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Adam, Adam has it there. Thank you. There we are. So a very colourful slide for you, just to say um, the foundation is trying to do what, we, what we've been doing for years in the UK, but trying to do that globally now. And um, we've got a few options for everybody. We've got scholarships, we've got leadership programmes, we've got membership. Um, and we've and this is based on the back of a new strategy our trustees have approved, which is called um, develop, uh, uh, improving and improving care saving lives, one million nurse and midwife leaders. So we really want to see by the end of 2020 how much how many people our work can reach. Um, and so I'll leave that there for, for the last people who are still on the call. But I want to thank everybody who's been on the call for spending your, um, is it Monday? It is Monday, isn't it? Yes. Monday, evening, Monday evening with us. And I can see wonderful words like empowering, pioneering change, empower value. Thank you, really interesting. Thank you, very insightful, inspiring. Empower value. Thank you, great importance of valuing others. Um, uh, investment nurse education, nurse research is key to shifting these paradigms. Just brilliant. Thank you so much, both of you. And, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you, Linda. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Goodbye.